Consecrate yourself, therefore, to be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make yourselves unclean of any unswarming things that swarm on the earth. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. So this week I listened to that message, uh, Chris Vallotton from, from Bethel, and um, I, just a lot of things that he said in there just kind of resonated with me personally. And, and, and one of the main things that I pulled away from, and if you listen to it, you may not even have gotten this, but it was this whole theme about if I'm not seeing more, why is that? What's keeping me from having this awesome, abundant life? What's keeping people in my church from having awesome, abundant life. Now, we're seeing miracles, and we're seeing doors open, and we're seeing lives being transformed, and, and that's good. But we also are still, still seeing people struggling with some things they've been struggling with, or still dealing with some things that they need to be dealing with. So what is that? Now, look, I'm not saying <laughs> you have left a door open somewhere in your life. I'm not saying that. That may be true, but I'm not saying that. What I'm saying to you is is there something that you haven't really put to death yet that is keeping you from what God has for you? There's only enough room in your hand for one thing. You, we've all seen that thing where, where, the, where the person, the child, reaches down into the jar and grabs that big handful of candy. Can't get his, if you let go of the candy, you get your hand out of that jar. I don't want to let go of the candy. I want my hand out of the jar. Okay, you have to let go of the candy so you can get your hand out of the jar. But I really want the candy. Some of us are having this conversation with the Lord. Lord, I really want what's in here. Well, okay, but you're going to have to let go of it so I can give it to you. Well, but if I let go of it, you may, you may forget. I, if I let go of it, you may lose, you may, this one may go to somebody else. Somebody else may get this blessing, and I, and I want this blessing. Or, or, or God, you know, I, but I want it now. So maybe we need to examine some things in our life and see why we're not having more of this abundant life that Christ promises us. So let's look at... Um, uh, John, sorry, John chapter 12. Um, and here, here we go. I'll try to keep up with, uh, with this. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to, to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me where and where I am. There my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So this word life is the same word that we saw when we started. It's the same word that's in, it's in Deuteronomy. It's the same word that's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke when, when it talks about love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, life and soul it's that same it's it's that energy it's that power it's that it's that um muchness that it was talking about so in order to experience more of the lord i have to be willing to experience less of me now he'll let me experience me all day long but he's sitting there going dude what i have for you is way better it's way better. I'll let you hold that as long as you want to hold that, but you have to be willing to let that die so that I can bring this new thing up in you. Um, I, I, this picture of the wheat field, it's, it's amazing in, in, in the fact that all of nature is a, is a testimony to the process of death and new life. A seed has to fall to the earth and die and then that's when the process of life really begins. Now, you and I know that the potential of life is always in that seed. So even though we call it death, it's just like when Jesus said that Lazarus is dead. Oh, well, if he, or Lazarus was asleep. Oh, well, if he's asleep, he'll be, no, no, he's actually dead. But see, even though he's dead, he still has the potential of life. You know why? Because I'm here. Because I'm here, there's always the potential for life 
even in the midst of death. And so we have to be willing to die in, in the Christian walk. Another thing that he said that I just thought was incredible, and uh, we actually have an opportunity to do a baptism here in a few weeks. Um, so th- those of you who might be interested in that can talk to me about it. But communion is a, is a, is a remembrance. We do this in remembrance. But baptism isn't remembering. It's kind of prophetic. Yeah, I was, I'm dead to sin, but I am raised to newness in life. And guess how many of y'all are still in newness of life? If you're with the Lord, you're still in the midst of that newness of life. You're still coming out of the water. You're still on your journey to becoming everything God wants you to be and experiencing everything God wants you to be. And that's really exciting. So the, so the growth cycle, the, the, the dying, and then we begin to grow, and we take one apple seed put it in the ground, it grows an apple tree, the apple tree is full of apples, how many seeds are in each of those apples? It's just this beautiful picture of the gospel. One person died, Jesus died, and from him came this tree, and off that tree came many fruit. And after each of those free, fruit, there are, there are more fruit trees and more fruit trees. I mean, uh, it's, it's a pretty amazing, if you've ever um, seen kudzu, that stuff really spreads. Um, I'm not sure there's a seed there, so that may be a bad example, but you know what I'm saying. John chapter 3, verse 30 says, He must increase, but I must decrease. Now, who was saying this? It was John the baptizer, John the Baptist. And he is saying to his followers, to his disciples, and, and look, I, I don't know, one of, one of the, next Sunday, I'm going to, I'm going to share with you uh, what God's laid on my heart is my seven core leadership principles. And, and I, I felt like I was supposed to do this, and, and I did it, and I've been sharing with uh, uh, Steve and, and Dave as I've been developing it. But, but one of them is, is that, we, that I always honor, I, I honor and value every spiritual gift. I honor and value every ministry. I honor and value every other ministry. In other words, uh, my friend Bart over at the Pavilion, he is not my competition. He's my partner in ministry. Mark Lancaster at One Stone, not my competition, my partner in ministry. Aaron Allison at Church at Indian Lake, not my competition. He's my partner in ministry. He's doing what he's doing because that's what God's told him to do. He's doing what he's doing because that's what God's done. He's doing what I'm doing what I'm doing. It's awesome, and I can honor that. I also can honor the fact that there are some of you in here who have spiritual gifts that I don't have. And instead of me going, well, I need to really downplay their spiritual gift to play up mine. No, I'm glad you have what you have. I'm glad that my wife has spiritual gifts that I don't have. It completes us. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. Why am I saying all this? Well, because John, John could have been like, "Ah, you know, y'all stay with me. But he was like, no, go follow Jesus. I have to decrease so that he can increase. John, John was okay being the weirdo in the room. Dude, the way you dress, the stuff you eat. And and you're always giving away your, you're always giving away your disciples. That's that is not any way to build a Fortune 500 company here. Man, you, you, have you not read all the books about growing a thriving church? You can't give away all your stuff. John was like, oh, no, I, actually, I can. See, I have to decrease so that he can increase. Christians, we have to decrease so that he can increase. So if you're not seeing the increase from him that you would like to see, let me suggest maybe you need to look at yourself and go, is there somewhere where maybe I need to decrease? Is there something that I kind of need, I kind of have my hands wrapped around, I'm going to control this one thing. God, you can have everything in my house, except for this one room. God, you can have everything in my life, except for this one thing. (laughs) In order for him to increase, I have to decrease. Luke chapter 9, we see something pretty exciting happen. Luke chapter 9 is where Jesus sends out the 12. Now, there's another time where he sends out a larger group. But in Luke chapter 9, Jesus is going to send out the 12. And now, understand, this is, this is my theology on it, that 
when Jesus sent out the 12, he sent them out with his, his anointing. But guess what? We don't live under his anointing anymore because we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have, yes, we have Jesus' anointing, but we have it because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. The 12 disciples didn't have the presence of the Holy Spirit in them yet because that hadn't all happened. So they went out in Jesus' strength. But what did they do? Everything Jesus said they could do. They were healing the sick. They were raising the dead. They were, they were, you know, setting the captives free. I mean, it was awesome. Jesus, and what did Jesus tell them? Jesus said this. He called his 12 together. He gave them the power and authority over all demons and, uh, to, and, demons and to heal p- diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. I'm not showing you the scripture yet because I'm fixing to do something. And he said for them, take this for the journey. Take a staff. Take a bag. Take bread. Take money. Oh, you're going to need to have two tunics in case one of them gets dirty. Oh, and for God's sake, take enough change in case you got to get a camel. Is that what Jesus said? No, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, and he said to them, take nothing for the journey. Wait, Jesus, you don't understand. In the economy that we live in, you, you got to have stuff. You, you got to have stuff. And Jesus is like, okay, but see, I'm not working off your economy. I'm working off my father's economy. My father doesn't really care about your stuff wearing out because he can always give you new stuff. He can give you more stuff. He actually can give you better stuff. No, really? Yes, he can actually give you better stuff. So he said to them, take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even take uh, two tunics apiece. Take nothing so that you can be used to do everything. What if the amount of things that we can do for the Lord are limited by the space we have in our hand? I got the suitcase and it's full of stuff. And God says, well, for everything you take out of that suitcase, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replace it with some type of blessing. Well, wow, that's awesome. Okay. Well, I don't need this and I don't need this, but I really need this and I really like this. And oh man, my my grandmother gave me these things. I can't get rid of these things. And, and so, you know, it's like, okay, God, I, w- I want you to fill this up. And God says, well, empty it out. Well, I have kind of. I'm, I just want to be mostly dead all day. <laughs> He's saying, no, just be completely dead all day. I got this. Because what I'm going to replace is way, way, way better. So the amazing thing happens here that Jesus... Um, Jesus tells his disciples, here's what to do. Go with nothing. The story continues. Jesus has given them instructions. Uh, They go. They have an awesome time. They come back. Jesus said, tell me what happens. Oh, Jesus, it was awesome. We did this, and we did that, and we saw this person healed, and we cast this demon out, and it was awesome. It was awesome. It was awesome. And now they're they're in front of 5,000-plus people, and and, uh, everybody's hungry, and the guys are going, Jesus, it's getting kind of late. I think we should send everybody home so that, you know, that we can have supper, and they can go have supper. And Jesus said, oh, well, you feed them. Remember, they just came off this exciting mission trip where we saw all these things. We didn't take anything, and yet none of us starved. None of us even lost weight. It was amazing. We had more than enough because we trusted you. We'll feed these people. Well, uh, Jesus, you don't understand. Uh, we, uh, we actually, you know, because you wouldn't let us take stuff. Well, we didn't have any stuff when we came back. We just had, you know, what we'd eaten. And so we really can't, we really can't afford to feed these 5,000 people. Dudes. Quit thinking out of your wallet and start thinking out of God's wallet. Do you think God has enough to feed 5,000 people? Well, I never really thought about it. Well, think about it for a minute. And I'm asking you to think about it. Does your God have enough to meet your needs and the needs of your neighbor and the need of your family and the need of your church and the needs of this world? Does he have enough or is he limited? Well, I mean, he's He's, pretty, he's pretty, pretty rich, but, you know, he's not that rich. He's that rich. He's that amazingly rich. And so <laughs> Jesus like, okay, guys, um, uh, you're a little frustrating, fellas. But what we're going to do here is I'm going to teach you how to do this. Have everybody sit down. Bring me what we've got. 
Here's the part you guys were leaving out. 